have you now been waiting to cast your ballot? Like two and a half hours. Uh, about an hour and a half. Two and a half hours or so. Like I've been here since like one-ish. We both have had to miss class. Yeah. Physicals. Like I almost wanted to leave, but I didn't. I wouldn't miss this for anything. grow up with this idea of American exceptionalism. But yet when you look at the turnout rates of young people our ages in other countries, they are much higher. Voting affects everybody no matter what, whether you vote or not. For something that is so important to our country, are we doing enough? Personally, I think that the reason that we don't see higher rates of young voters that we do says much more about our democratic processes and not about young people themselves. Millennials and, and Gen Z at this point are the largest share of the potential electorate, and if they were voting at proportional rates to older voters, they would be setting the agenda across the country, up and down the ballot, for the issues that we should be prioritizing. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming today. I am Brianna Sia, founder and CEO of Generation Vote a youth-led organization dedicated to advancing youth voting rights in New York and beyond and transforming the way young people engage in local politics. I am not only here as a leader of a youth voting rights organization, but also as a 23 years old who is concerned about the future of our democracy and the safety of my neighbors in Prospect Heights, Brooklyn. A lot of people assume that young people do not care about voting because of our lower youth voting turnout, right, when compared to other age groups. But the reality is young people are saying that they are now more politically aware than ever before. If you look at other issue areas like criminal justice reform, climate change, immigration reform, our generation has fueled incredible youth-led movements to really change the political landscape and change what is possible. We need to make youth voting rights and fighting against voter suppression a major base-building issue for our generation. So let's start with like intro. Uh, again, just who you are and then uh, what brought you to Genco. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Maggie. Um, I I come to Gen Vote more with a background in like climate work. Um, the things that we want out of climate mm -hmm. legislation are so much more radical than what gets discussed most of the time. But if we can increase the amount of young people who like really feel empowered, not only through voting, but also understanding their political system mm -hmm. thoroughly enough that they can participate in it, it's necessary for any of the progressive movements we care about. Right on. Cool. Right on. I'm from a developing nation where democracy has always been at jeopardy. Voting is at the very core of like every movement. So I'm like, let's start here. We have seen local governments across the country from the East Coast to the West Coast, North to South, put in laws to make sure that our voices will not be heard this November. Sometimes it is intentional where we see folks creating systems or processes designed to make it harder for certain populations, and sometimes it's just thoughtless. Some of the laws that they have implemented to prevent young people, particularly college students, from voting are things like making poll sites inaccessible on college campuses, restrictive voter ID laws that make it almost impossible for young people new to that state to register to vote, taking away early voting sites from college campuses like what we saw in Texas, and as a result, Texas students having to wait on six or seven hour lines in this past primary. And we've also seen things like states not implementing or taking away policies that would enfranchise young people, such as automatic vote registration, online vote registration, and pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds. We need to raise hell about it and make sure that young people know that this is a crisis. I am a student at Winston-Salem State University. 
I'm going to be a poll monitor in uh, Forsyth County. Any questions about that? If they have to do same day registration, if they, by presenting something, what would they need to present? They actually took away the polling site in Winston-Salem um, a couple years back, and um, that's the closest site that there is to our school. The back and forth in North Carolina has been, been unjustifiable, in my opinion. They took away polling places near colleges and universities. And it has primarily been driven by the fact that they were well used by students, so they have tried to put them in less convenient places. I don't know if you would label that voter suppression, but it probably did suppress the vote because these are college students. A lot of them don't have cars. Four years ago, we had a polling site on campus. I was able to go vote in the student union and students were engaged. In 2008 and 2012, as we know, specifically black students turned out in record numbers. So there is no reason to say that our, our site should be taken away. You know, when it comes to having reasons, rationale for legislative actions, there's always rationale. Uh, you know what, one that does come up a lot is they'll say that there needs to be access to parking for other community right. members to be able to come to campus and access them. So they tried using that justification to then say college campuses should not be a valid place to hold early voting sites or sites on election day. And people saw that for what it was, they were like, you blatantly just don't want students voting. Generally, you want to have polling locations where people are, and campuses are a place where there are a lot of people, and not just students, right? It's all of the staff and faculty and administrators that work there as well. And studies showed that having polling sites on college campuses actually makes it more accessible for young voters in their community and for people of color in their community to, to have uh, an accessible, open location on a college campus. It actually increases turnout. So it makes sense to have polling sites on campuses. Yeah. Well, my name is John Locke. I'm a student at University of Houston downtown. We're a Hispanic serving institution and a minority serving institution. And those are a couple of the lowest voting blocks. Tacked on to that is that, you know, we have mainly millennials here, which is another one of the lowest voting blocks as well. So it's like, man, we have all these negatives against the university. How do we tackle this problem? Okay. How's everybody doing today? So that was the premise behind Walk the Vote. There was a time where voting was celebrated. And, and this Walk the Vote model is bringing that concept back to life. It's celebrating our democracy and making voting fun again. The controversy in Texas was often over student IDs. So if you're a student at a college or university, it's a government-issued ID, but that ID is not acceptable. So if you show up at a polling precinct in San Antonio and you're a student of UTSA or a polling precinct in uh, Austin and you're, you're a Longhorn, that student ID won't let you vote. But you can use your concealed carry gun permit. The student ID, it was determined by the legislature, was not as reliable as the concealed handgun. Now right there, to me, there's a discrepancy. Who has student IDs? Younger voters. The voter ID law definitely sets people back. And the county clerk's office gave us materials about the voting ID laws that tells you all right, what forms of IDs are accepted and then like if you don't have them, what you can use. So I, I don't try to demonize any groups or anything like that. But it, I mean, there is a level of difficulty and there is something we need to look at, especially in the state of Texas, having one of the lowest voter turnout rates. Texas has really been sort of a battleground against student voter suppression for yeah. decades. 18, 19, and 20 year olds have only had the right to vote in this country since the early 1970s. And shortly after the 26th Amendment was ratified, there was a case that made its way all the way up to the Supreme Court that involved some students at an HBCU in Texas. So at Prairie View, they decided to um, register to vote and they tried to vote. And essentially what happens is they get indicted. And when they get indicted for illegally voting, this case goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says that not only are college students in Prairie View residents of Waller County and are allowed to vote there, 
but so are all students. So the minute you move away from your parents' house and you go to live in a dorm, you get your first apartment, you are a resident of that place where you live and you get to vote there. But I think it's important to know that even with that court case, Waller County's never stopped trying to prevent those students from voting. And I think the, the fact that they keep trying to prevent them from voting is a sign that they understand the potential power of the campus. We've seen efforts this year in response to the pandemic where uh, lawmakers in the Senate have introduced a bill to make sure that colleges are making it easier for young people to get access to information for how to vote by mail and how to vote safely in a pandemic. But beyond 2020, I think that we have a lot of work to do on the federal and state level to advance a new agenda for youth voting rights. This is probably one of the three tumultuous, most tumultuous times in the history of the country. And I think that it is a fantastic time to have that kind of reaffirmation of our democratic values. There's lots of people my age who want to contribute in a tangible way. We do, we do care about our HBCU, we care about our future, we care about um, our education, so we're gonna vote. I just want to encourage people to get involved, to not doubt themselves, to not doubt the impact that they can have in their community and in their government. We have to go and vote. Like, this is what we got to do. 